Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which I hope will bring you all some new insights into hydrogen and its development both here and in Asia and of course from a more global perspective as well. My name is Peter Godfrey and I'm the Managing Director of the Energy Institute here in uh, Singapore. Uh, and uh, let me just share my screen and we'll make a start if I can get myself on. There we go. The Energy Institute is a unique UK-based professional body focused entirely on bringing global energy expertise together. Its mission may be simply summarized as ensuring that energy and the critical role that it plays in our world today is better understood, better managed, and better valued. This is especially important within the context of the rapidly evolving energy transition underway and its implications for a world requiring ever more energy delivered sustainably with security and safety and, of course, at affordable prices. The EI spans the world of energy from conventional oil and gas to the most innovative renewable and energy efficient technologies by gathering and sharing essential knowledge about energy, the skills and the good practice needed to keep it safe and secure. As an independent, not-for-profit, safe space for evidence-based collaboration, we act as an honest broker between industry, academia and policymakers and given the pace of economic growth and energy markets throughout Asia, we are keen to forge strong collaborative relationships with like-minded energy professional institutional organizations here in the region with the intent of creating greater global connectivity to the sharing of good practice. The Energy Institute offers many different types of individual and corporate memberships, and by becoming part of our global community, you will be helping the world to work towards a safer, more secure, and sustainable energy system wherever you live. Do please take a look at our website and if you're interested, follow the blue OCR link at the bottom right of your screen. The subject of our webinar today is the development of hydrogen, an area that the Energy Institute is becoming more and more actively engaged in. And please follow the orange OCR link on this slide to have a look at our Hydrogen Energy Essentials Guide to Hydrogen which presents an interesting introduction into the whole subject, if that is of interest to you. Before we start, let me just quickly go through some basic housekeeping rules, if I may. The webinar will aim to last for one hour formally, so formal presentations, and then we'll allow up to 30 minutes for Q&A, depending on how many we get. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available through the EI website. Uh, to all registered participants, um, and they will all receive a link. I'm pleased to say that we've had over 300 registrants for this event, which is a record for our region, and uh, we're very happy to see you all here today. All participants' lines will be muted throughout the event, so please, if you want to post a question, put it on the Q&A section, uh, and we will look at that and, and make sure that I answer as many of those questions and, and, and pose them to the panel as I possibly can as we start the event. And of course, at the end, we'll run a little survey. Do please make some comments as we're very keen to learn how we can improve these events going forwards. Now, let me just talk a little bit about um, the event tonight and what we hope to cover. Many, many energy industry professionals, whether from conventional renewables or evolving energy sector backgrounds, now believe that hydrogen is critical to the world's ability to reach net zero by mid-century, as neither renewable energy nor the pivot towards maximizing electrification alone can achieve this target, especially in hard to abate sectors like the heavy industries and the high horsepower transportation sectors. They believe that hydrogen will replace oil as the primary fuel in various spheres of life as primarily it is easy to store and in large quantities and provides a viable alternative fuel for uses that cannot be electrified. Whilst these energy experts now believe that in the future green hydrogen will become the undisputed leader among renewable energy sources, as excess green energy is generated from surplus solar, wind and other sources such as hydro and possibly even nuclear coming back in the future. These experts also realize 
that the surplus power required to supply such a growing market estimated to require some 10 times the current production capacity by 2050 for markets to become self-sustaining does not exist today and is unlikely to do so for some time to come in most markets. But according to Goldman Sachs, green hydrogen could supply up to 25% of the world's energy needs by 2050 and become a $10 trillion market by that time. However, to achieve this goal, green hydrogen will have to be produced at prices comparable, comparable to the cost of current energy carriers. Encouragingly, the cost of producing hydrogen is beginning to show signs of dropping, according to recent figures released by the US Department of Energy. Analysis shows that a price of around $2 per kilogram production rate will be the tipping point that will make hydrogen competitive in most industries, including transportation, steel and fertilizer production, and even some in power generation. Today's prices range from anything from around 260 to 5 kilograms for green hydrogen and below 2 to about $4 um, dollars per kilogram for blue hydrogen, which obviously is hydrogen developed mainly by natural gas with CCS, and turquoise hy hydrogen, which effectively takes um, the natural gas hydrocarbons and turns the carbon dioxide into a carbon byproduct, depending on the production scheme that people are looking at. And of course, the advanced countries are stepping up their investments in the development of hydrogen energy. The European Union has recently allocated 500 billion in investments in hydrogen production. Russia aims to capture as much as 20% of the global hydrogen market by 2030, said Pavel Sorokin, deputy head of the Ministry of Energy, just last April the 12th. The Russian government plans for green energy productions are linked to the fact that European Union plans to introduce a special tax on imports of energy carriers with a large footprint. So therefore, if they don't do hydrogen, they're going to have a very large tax bill when they import hydrocarbons into the rest of Europe. Last July, even Saudi Arabia, backed by the US giant air products, started to construct the world's largest power plant. The 5 billion project will produce something like 650 tons of green hydrogen daily. So lots is happening. And of course, in this region, in the Asia region, from where I am actually talking from, we have Japan, who have made goals attaining to carbon neutrality by 2050, who have spurred a number of public and private sector initiatives to develop hydrogen as a leading fuel source. Over the next 30 years, Japan intends to import between 5 and 10 million tons of hydrogen per year to meet its decarbonized energy needs. And South Korea is aiming for 20% of its energy mix in 2050 to be based on hydrogen. South Korea has indicated a hydrogen economy is fundamental to achieving a 40% reduction in their carbon emissions by 2050. But of course, China leads the world in hydrogen production with an annual output of 22 million tons, about one third of the world's output, enough to cover one tenth of its vast energy needs already. However, most of China's production is currently associated with fossil fuel fired grey hydrogen with no carbon capture at this stage. So the country is stepping up substantial additional investments in green hydrogen energy guided by the government's new policy to develop the hydrogen industry, which was identified in, in the 14th five-year plan for this year to 25 as one of the six future priority en energy industries to develop. So as can be seen, a lot is happening. And even here in Singapore, just a couple of days ago, Shell announced that it will undertake feasibility studies with the aim of commissioning and operating a hydrogen fuel cell vessel for a 12-month trial period to test its performance in collaboration with SEMCORP here. So, hydrogen appears to be here and is going to, obviously, is poised for significant growth in the coming, de coming decade and beyond. But how should stakeholders, particularly here in Asia, be positioning to take advantage of this potentially massive investment cycle? Coordinating strategies will be essential to successfully scale up. First and foremost, the supply and demand sides of the market need more regulatory certainty in order to commit to long-term investments. 
which will require both coordination between each side of that market, the supply and demand side, as well as governments that must help set targets for what the market will look like in the future. So we have a lot to talk about, and our focus of today's discussion is really to examine a number of different angles from both a Europe and a Western perspective, from an Asian perspective using Australia, China, and Japan as examples, and then looking effectively at the right mix of hydrogen technologies that need to be developed, both from a local, regionally, and potentially globally commoditized market development basis as hydrogen scales up. So these are the issues that I hope to cover, and we have a lot to cover in that short period of time. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our panel and to start the conversation. I'm very pleased to announce uh, Stephen Harrison uh, is joining us from Germany. Stephen is the principal and associate of the leading energy and chemicals advisory business Nexent ECI. He's focused on decarbonization and greenhouse gas emissions control with hydrogen development as a fundamental pillar of his work. And with a background in industry and speciality gases going back many years, uh, working for companies like VOC and the Linda Group, Stephen has an intimate knowledge of hydrogen from applications, commercial, technical, operational safety perspectives. So Stephen, without further ado, over to you to start the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. You've given such a sensational introduction there that I feel there's not much more left for me to say. <laughs> can you just uh, confirm, please, that you can see the uh, Nexon TCA logo in the presentation on the screen? Thank you. So, hello. Yes, I'm Steve. We're going to go through a lot of pictures extremely quickly during my presentation. Uh, here are some Nexon faces who you can follow up with after the, the call for sure. I've been asked to talk about applications and specifically the agenda that I'll be touching on um, covers hydrogen and I've put in green here as one of many solutions to decarbonize and then there's other words on here as well. Later on in the presentation we'll look at um, early stage deployment, no regrets use cases as people might uh, talk about it. Hydrogen as one of many solutions. Peter has alluded to electrification, solar, etc., carbon capture and storage. We will need lots of technologies to achieve the 2050 decarbonisation target. The speed at which, we, at which we've ramped up CO2 emissions worldwide has been like this. The speed which we need to come down is much faster. We need to deploy solutions much, much, much quicker than we've implemented um, our energy um, um, sector uh, infrastructure up to now. I sometimes say that hydrogen is one of the bullets in the gun. It's not a silver bullet. It's not the silver bullet. It's one of the bullets in the gun. And we need to go bang, 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 methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, renewables, CCS. We'll need to fire them all, including hydrogen. So, hydrogen is one of many solutions to decarbonize. Ammonia, ammonia is a sensationally good fuel. It's also a hydrogen carrier. People refer to it as a hydrogen derivative. Let's not forget, the ammonia shipping infrastructure is established. We can perhaps use ammonia a lot quicker than pure hydrogen. Hydrogen might come, but ammonia might be a sensational bridge. And ammonia is a hydrogen derivative, very, very closely linked. We ship it around. It can also be used uh, as a fuel uh, for shipping and other things as well. Very, very versatile. Methanol, another hydrogen derivative. Think of all of those bullets in the gun. Pow, ammonia. Pow, methanol. Pow, hydrogen. We will need them all. Methanol, another ammonia, a hydrogen derivative. Again, uh, ammonia supply chain infrastructure exists methanol, excuse me, <laughs> supply chain infrastructure exists today. Hydrogen, liquid hydrogen um, distribution on the oceans is emerging. We're seeing the first pilot take place right now between Australia um, and Japan on this ship here, the Suiza frontier. Hydrogen as a marine fuel, just like ammonia as a marine fuel, just like methanol as a marine fuel, um, also emerging. Many 
solutions. Lots of bullets in the gun. And of course, batteries just with cars, is it fuel cell vehicles, is it battery vehicles? The same can be said for this example that I'm focusing on, which is shipping. And here's a battery powered ship that's in development as well. So lots of solutions, we will need them all. Lots of solutions to decarbonize the future. No question that uh, there's a huge commitment uh, building up around that now. And my observation is the targets are coming forwards, not backwards. That's my observation right now in the last six months. I've only ever seen decarbonization targets becoming earlier, not later. And I think that is sensational. I think it's brilliant. Hydrogen and all of these other bullets in the gun will help to achieve that. I'm going to focus a little bit on carbon capture related to hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives. Here we are in Asia at an Asia conference. This is a lab one in Malaysia of natural gas to methanol. And we're doing carbon capture from methanol production already. Methanol, of course, is a hydrogen derivative. To make methanol, the first thing we do is make hydrogen. The point that I want to leave with you is that in terms of carbon capture and potentially carbon storage to decarbonize hydrogen, to decarbonize methanol production, we are doing it already today. And here's an example of a carbon capture unit uh, from Mitsubishi Heavy at uh, 500 tons per day um, in Qatar. Ammonia production. Here's a big SMR, and in the background is the Harbour Bosch reactor here related to the ammonia value chain. Again, ammonia starts with hydrogen. And here again is carbon capture from an ammonia production facility. Another Mitsubishi heavy plant, this time 450 tonnes per day. My point to you is that carbon capture related to ammonia, methanol, Hydrogen production is absolutely done at scale worldwide today. The storage bit, okay, that's a little bit more, um, a bit of a different story, but at least the capture technologies are 100% in place at scale. Um, hydrogen for refinery applications, desulfurization of fuels, hydrogenation of fuels. Here's a, a refinery um, in Spain. And here on the back of it, as you can perhaps see, is the carbon capture uh, plant uh, related to putting that carbon dioxide into the food and beverage sector as a marketable product. Again, refinery applications for hydrogen, methanol, ammonia, carbon capture already embedded in our thinking to decarbonize these processes. We need to do more carbon capture, more carbon capture and utilization, more carbon capture and storage. Hydrogen and CCS, in my opinion, are very, very, very closely linked. Going one step beyond CCS to BEX, BECCS, bioenergy and CCS. Let's not forget that methane, yes, it comes up with natural gas, but we can also produce it biogenically um, as uh, biogas and biogas upgrades. And if we're doing bioenergy CCS, we can establish, if we're careful about it, we can establish carbon negative processes. And one thing I have to remind people is the goal is net zero. The goal is not zero CO2 emissions. The goal is net zero. And what that means is that for some of the things that are going to be really, really tough to mitigate, we need some carbon negative technologies to balance the whole thing out to net zero. BEX, bioenergy, CCS, producing hydrogen from biomethane can really help there. As we come on to green, again, uh, Peter's already introduced um, green hydrogen um, from electrolysis. It's only green if the electrical power is renewable from wind or solar or hydro. It could be low carbon um, if it's from the nuclear, but then we might call it pink. Thermolysis of waste uh, for me is also a very interesting avenue for hydrogen production. Um, RDF, refuse derived fuels, plastics, for example, high in hydrocarbons, we can make hydrogen from those. It's not yet categorized as green or blue or anything like that, um, but I think in terms of the circular economy, I think it's a good way of reusing some of the materials that we might either incinerate um, or throw away. So thermolysis of, of waste um, to hydrogen, I think is something to, to, to watch out for. My theme is applications. I've been asked to talk about applications 
I've given you some things around decarbonization and hydrogen applications are very, very closely related to methanol, ammonia, hydrogen applications on the refinery, we've covered those. Here are some other, let's say, newer um, application cases related to, to hydrogen. Here's a chart, by the way, that just pretty much says what I've said to you in words. Uh, next some reports. The point that I'm going to make is that if we're already using hydrogen to make ammonia, methanol, and for refinery applications, substitution, gray hydrogen for blue hydrogen, or substitution of gray hydrogen for green hydrogen is clearly a very, very early adoption. Ammonia production accounts for more than 50% of hydrogen production today. A lot of that will switch from gray to blue to green hydrogen over time to decarbonize. We're still building new ammonia and methanol facilities around the world. Here's a, an absolutely massive ATR and SMR scheme underway. So the point is, as well as trying to decarbonize what we've got, we also need to cope with all of the growth that's taking place, a very, very significant challenge. Gas to methanol, natural gas to methanol, again, another application um, of hydrogen and uh, an application where we will see blue hydrogen uh, through decarbonization of these processes come into play as well. There's a lot of new processes being built uh, with hydrogen at the core in terms of hydrogen value chains. More hydrogen production for refineries so that we can process heavier and heavier fuels. There is a huge amount of growth related um, to established hydrogen applications. That pie chart that we've seen is simply going to get bigger um, and uh, a lot more hydrogen will be required. Other established applications of hydrogen at a smaller scale will also switch from grey to green and blue. Hydrogenation of vegetable oils to make margarine, for example. Hydrogen is used to make a float glass, a very, very popular construction material. The hydrogen that we're using there today is used from, made from fossil fuels without carbon dioxide mitigation. That will have to change. We can still make the hydrogen, we can still use the hydrogen, but in a blue or a green or another low carbon uh, manufacturing process. Other emerging applications where we're not using quite so much hydrogen today, data centers, power backup storage, uh, very, very important use for hydrogen. The idea is not to use any hydrogen, it's backup storage, but <laughs> we need to have hydrogen there in reserve. Heavy, heavy, heavy machinery. You know, some of the biggest machines in the world are related to mining and earth moving. A lot of those will require hydrogen to drive the uh, drive the power. Batteries can help, uh, but some of them are so big that hydrogen is really going to be required. Trains, again, high horsepower activity, as Peter was calling it, and very likely the batteries will be involved. Very, very likely that hydrogen will be involved as well. Electrification, of course, of train lines is already uh, great and super. Don't convert electric to hydrogen, convert diesel to hydrogen. Buses, again, high horsepower applications. CNG powered buses, great, a good step forwards from diesel. Hydrogen powered buses, also a good step forwards. And cars, yeah, will cars go battery? Will cars go hydrogen? I think in some countries, the answer will be one. In some countries, the answer will be other. As we get to smaller vehicles, uh, the batteries become more and more attractive. As I said before, lots of bullets in the gun. Pow, pow, we need to fire them all. Batteries are also going to be a really important part of our future. This is one very, very interesting application when we talk about no regrets applications here for hydrogen. If, you're going to, if you want to invest in hydrogen, here's perhaps a place to look. Uh, indoor um, logistics centers, forklift trucks, started out going to batteries, switched to hydrogen. Some distribution and uh, transportation mobility applications started out hydrogen and have now switched to batteries. But here's one that's gone from batteries to hydrogen because people want to be driving those forklift trucks 24 hours a day, not having them up against a charging station um, eight hours a day and uh, have assets that are underutilized. So here's a very, very, very popular um, hydrogen mobility application today, perhaps one of the best no regrets use cases that you might imagine at present in the mobility sphere. What next for hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives? Okay, well, ammonia, again, 
a hydrogen derivative, a super fuel. We can burn it on gas turbines. We can perhaps even burn it on aeroplanes, but ammonia is a very, very good fuel. We can track it back to hydrogen, but it's also a sensational fuel in its own right. We can put ammonia onto coal-fired power plants. And I think in Japan, there's a plan that all the coal-fired power plants will be 20% ammonia admixing by 2030. Um, it burns, it's a very, very good fuel. Direct reduction of iron to substitute Coke. Here's a Coke oven. Uh, we put Coke into the blast furnace as a reducing agent, not for heat, but as a chemical reducing agent. And that's where hydrogen can really, really, really come to the fore. As Peter was saying, the economics of using hydrogen as an energy vector, they vary according to the application. But if we need it as a reducing agent for direct reduction of iron, there's not so many alternatives that we can consider. It's something that we can't electrify. We can electrify heat, but we can't electrify the reducing properties of hydrogen or coke. So this is also a really sensational, no regrets use case in my opinion. Heating, okay. Will it be biomethane? Will it be more natural gas? Will it be hydrogen? You know, good questions. Will it be admixing? Will the Russians be sending us hydrogen to Europe um, on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline very soon? Let's hope so. And synthetic, and synthetic aviation fuels, um, you know, using hydrogen and carbon dioxide um, to make um, synthetic aviation fuels with uh, fission trop uh, type processes or simply hydrogen powered aircraft. And perhaps if you'd spotted it, um, there was one of the future Airbus hydrogen powered aircraft concepts um, on Peter's um, slide earlier on. Will it be synthetic aviation fuels, synthetic jet on the aeroplane or pure hydrogen? Let's wait and see. Or it could be, again, lots of bullets in the gun all of the above. And that's very much my closing message to you. When we talk about hydrogen and other alternative energy sources, for me, it's not a question of or. We shouldn't be asking methanol or ammonia, hydrogen or ammonia. We shouldn't be asking green hydrogen or blue hydrogen. In my opinion, we should always be saying and, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, methanol and ammonia and hydrogen, all the bullets in the gun, Pow, pow, pow. We need to do everything as quickly as we possibly can and as much of it as we possibly can. Thank you. Stephen, thank you very much for giving us such a wonderful round robin tour of all these bullets in the gun. Uh, now, I want to take this bullets and gun uh, analogy to the stage of saying clearly they're going to be different bullets and different guns in different parts of the world. So, what we now need to do is to begin to start honing and polishing what you have beautifully laid out in terms of all the different technologies from a regional perspective and begin to start looking at how we develop a strategy to scale up within that context. So without further ado, I have great pleasure in inviting Martin Lambert to speak next. He's a senior research fellow of the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Uh, Martin joined OAS in, in 2017, I believe, and now specializes in renewable gas and hydrogen. He will have forgotten this, but actually I knew Martin as an LNG guy when he was actually seconded by Shell to manage the Northwest Shelf Australia project many years ago. So we, we have various touch points, and I'm greatly looking forward, Martin, to what you have to say about where is it all going in Europe? Where is hydrogen actually going? And how do you see the bullets in the gun being used going forwards? Over to you, sir. Wait a moment. Martin? Yeah. On top of there. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Martin. Can okay, good. I. Uh... I, I couldn't find the unmute button, otherwise to be on mute. Can you hear me? That's good. And you can see my slides too. Yes, we can. Good. Okay, great. So thank you, introduction, Peter, and hello to everyone. It's great to be here. So as Peter said, I'm from the OIS, the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies. Uh, we're an independent think tank, and we look at all aspects of the global energy system, but increasingly we're looking at the energy transition. In my particular area, I'm looking at decarbonisation of gas, and that means looking in some detail at biomethane and hydrogen. Um, there's some tendency for people to get overexcited about prospects of hydrogen, and I think Stephen's talk shows well why that might be, um, because 
the um, you know, there are loads of things you could start with. So the question really is what is realistic and pragmatic and where do we start and how do we go about it? And that's really our focus in OIES. Uh, and as Peter said, early in my career, I spent you know, 30 years in mainstream gas and LNG business for Shell. And so I think from that, I have a pretty good understanding of what is required to turn some great ideas into robust and investable business propositions. So my focus today is on Europe. So without more ado, I'll press on with that. Um, so are we talking uh, about Europe in general? But there's a paper that I published recently with a colleague, Simon Schulter, from the Institute of Energy Economics in Cologne. Um, the picture is on the screen. You can find it to download for free on our website. And it compares the approach to hydrogen in six key European countries. Uh, um, in some ways, 2020, you can look back at that was a year of hydrogen strategies. So the EU um, published a landmark strategy in July 2020. Uh, France, Germany, Netherlands and Spain, they all did as well. Italy published a draft and the UK is promising us a hydrogen strategy for around the middle of this year, but has already given quite a lot of detail about its thinking on the subject. I think the headline observation from all of that uh, is that different countries are looking at things in different ways. And it comes back to Stephen's multiple bullets. They all need to be fired, but the choice of when they get fired might be different in different countries. So this little summary um, shows um, the different approaches in the six key countries in Europe that we looked at. Um, we've spoken already today about blue versus green, and so that's well known. So the blue from natural gas with carbon capture, uh, green from electrolysis using renewables. Um, in Spain and Italy, they're pretty much purely focused on the renewable hydrogen, and that probably makes sense because they are expected to have low cost renewable power available. At Germany, is also uh, focused on green, but that's perhaps for a less good reason uh, because carbon capture and storage has been highly controversial in Germany. Some signs it may be changing, um, but the German hydrogen strategy uh, only mentioned blue very briefly and in the context of potential imports. France, so that um, half circle in France is a purple color. Um, because they've got lots of nuclear power, and so they see potential for using that surplus nuclear power for electrolysis. Meanwhile, the UK and Netherlands, perhaps to different degrees, have what I think we'd say is a more pragmatic approach, and again, consistent with Stephen's multiple bullets. Uh, blue, then green, seems to make a lot of sense. Um, so uh, decarbonise quickly with carbon capture and storage, um, and then move on. Uh, and then as soon as green hydrogen scales up and comes down in cost, you can move to that as the end game. In terms of imports versus exports, uh, again, different approaches in different countries. Germany is pretty clear. It needs to be an importer of hydrogen in the longer term. Spain thinks it could be an exporter. Uh, Italy, on the other hand, could be importing from North Africa, um, becoming a hub, and then transiting it on uh, through into Northern Europe. One other observation, uh, which this slide makes in a fairly complex way, perhaps, is that we need to look at hydrogen in the context of other gaseous fuels, and indeed in the context of the overall energy system. But focusing on gaseous fuels on this slide, this is an analysis from a European group of transmission system operators called Gas for Climate. And so being gas TSOs, they were quite bullish about prospects of gaseous fuels. But on the left-hand side, I think the first thing to emphasize is that uh, in a net zero world, there's um, no role for unabated gas, but there is a role for some biomethane, some natural gas with, hydrogen, with uh, CCS, and some hydrogen. And so a balance between all of those. 
So Steve mentioned biogas in the context of making hydrogen. Biogas and biomethane could well have a zero carbon role in their own right. What the balance turns out to be between them? Well, that's kind of uncertain. But again, with the multiple bullet story, I think we're going to see we're going to need um, large quantities of both. Uh, and for blue hydrogen, yeah, it's going to be um, some blue and some green. Um, and I'll show the costs of that uh, in just a moment. On the right hand side of the chart, uh, looking at the uses, uh, it's quite striking. I think the decline in gas use in buildings in Europe is seen to be quite substantial. Um, that's because uh, the perception is there'll be more and more heat pumps, so highly efficient electric heat pumps, but then some gas required, perhaps in combination in hybrid heat pumps. For industry and power generation, currently, of course, in power generation, gas has a very big role uh, and balancing renewables is a big role as well. Over time, we see that shifting uh, from methane towards hydrogen. And so more hydrogen will be used in industry, replacing methane and for other uses like steel production. Uh, and for power generation, then more hydrogen will be used there to balance the grid. I think at the bottom right of this chart, we find a bit optimistic um, about methane in transport. Um, as uh, again, back to Stephen's talk, um, I think some balance of battery electric vehicles and hydrogen. And in fact, I think in many sectors, the race has been won and battery electric vehicles will do the job uh, wherever it can. And so hydrogen would have to pick up the niches of things like long distance, heavy duty transport. So I've alluded to cost a bit already, but here's a chart on costs. And the first thing to say is that there is no business case for people to invest in low carbon hydrogen today. So it requires industry and governments to work together to create that business case. And we'll come back to how that might work a bit later on. In terms of scale, the EU hydrogen strategy talks about two times 40 gigawatts of hydrogen production by 2030. And then by 2024, just three years away, it envisages six gigawatts of green hydrogen production. And I say that's ambitious because six gigawatts, at 6,000 megawatts, whereas the largest electrolyzer project being built today is 10 megawatts. So you need to go from 10 megawatt scale to 6,000 megawatts uh, in three years. And uh, there are some projects talking about 100 megawatts, they could well be on stream uh, within that time, but 6,000 megawatts still sounds very ambitious. And not least because from a cost point of view. So I think, I guess from an Asian gas perspective, probably uh, dollars per million BTU are more familiar than dollars per tonne or dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. So in dollars per million BTU terms, the cost of green hydrogen today is probably around 50 to 70 dollars per million BTU, um, which is pretty expensive. Um, and it's a combination of the price of the renewable electricity and the cost of electrolyzers. In fact, people often forget about between 60 and 80 percent of that cost is from the price of the electricity. Um, so, yes, electrolyzers should come down in cost, but we need the price of the electricity to come down dramatically as well. And hopefully then by 2030, we'd still get we'd get to around the $30 um, dollars per million BTU range, which is getting on to be comparable with blue hydrogen um, at a um, slight premium to grey. But all of that is still pretty expensive. If I click on a couple more, so you can say so biomethane is definitely cheaper and natural gas is cheaper still. Um, so, so five to ten dollars a million BTU for natural gas today, 50 to 70 for green hydrogen. There's clearly a huge gap that needs to be closed. Um, and so lots of work to be done in order to do that. 
moving on then to some data about demand in Europe today. So the right hand chart here shows the demand for hydrogen and in the units of terawatt hours per year to make it more understandable. If you refer a billion cubic meters of gas, divide by about 10, and that gives you the sort of order of magnitude. So you can see that Germany and the Netherlands are the largest hydrogen consumers in the main countries in Europe we looked at. Um, but also you can see that natural gas demand is 10 times. So compare the scales of the two charts, and natural gas demand is an order of magnitude 10 times higher than hydrogen demand. Um, so there's an awful long way to go. The scale of the energy system is huge, and for hydrogen to even for low carbon hydrogen to ramp up to supply existing hydrogen demand is already a challenge. To do anything, even part of the role of natural gas today is even more challenging. So this is the current picture. If you then look forward, even just to 2030, we found that there's a very wide range of demand forecasts uh, looking out to 2030. And the range to 2050 is kind of is even bigger and not really worth considering at the moment. Uh, I think our conclusion from the numbers on this chart is that between now and 2030, it's already going to be pretty challenging to get enough low carbon hydrogen supply just to, de to decarbonize that existing industrial hydrogen demand. So ammonia production, use in oil refining, um, and then perhaps to decarbonize some steel production. So if you focus purely on the industrial sector, uh, then you already got plenty of volumetric demand uh, for, uh, for using up the low carbon hydrogen you might produce. So therefore, probably in Europe, yeah, I mean, it's no surprise that the big electrolyzers, so these 10 to 50 megawatt ones, possibly expansion to 100 megawatts, they've been built at the big refineries in Europe. So the current 10 megawatt one under construction is at Shell's refinery in Germany. They've announced a plan to expand it now to 100 megawatts, but even at 100 megawatts, that will just supply 10% of that refinery's hydrogen demand. So I hope this kind of paints a picture of the scale uh, which is required. The other challenge, of course, is that as well as scale, is making it into an economic proposition. Um, and all those refinery projects I talked about, they're based on EU funding. Um, and so uh, with, the, with the scale of numbers like chart, so around the 10 terawatt hours, you're going to need a one gigawatt plant running for 3,000 uh, hours a year, so a typical uh, wind farm load factor, and that will give you just three terawatt hours of production. So uh, you can see the scale challenge is absolutely huge, uh, but progress is starting to be made. Briefly, a slight digression, I want to show that while hydrogen could play a big role, it's very much policy driven. <clears throat> so here's a chart on um, comparing the UK Two scenarios for national grid, uh, one with a very high hydrogen uptake where the system transforms, but as consumers transform, the yellow bit is much more electricity. So the choice between electrification and hydrogen um, is um, really depends on government policy. Speaking of policy in the UK, um, as I said, we're still waiting on a hydrogen strategy, but this was the 10 point plan from the UK government which came out um, towards the end of last year. And I've highlighted in yellow the bits where hydrogen plays a role. So hydrogen will be very important within Europe. So that brings me on to the final point really about how to turn this from an aspiration into a business. Um, and so I made the point, government has to be involved in creating the business case, but actually, is that revolutionary? Maybe it's not. So again, as Peter alluded to, I spent a long time working in the LNG business, actually started back in the 1980s. And some of the early days of the LNG business, 
that involved um, long-term contracts, reliable off-takers, um, government involvement, negotiating appropriate terms of government. And so you can see parallels. So since then, the gas industry has moved on and we liberalise things a lot. But that old model of um, alignment between buyers and sellers, um, government involvement to agree the, the fiscal terms, uh, there is some um, role there which can be done. And you can also you can keep competition going as well. So um, if the government organise auctions for carbon contracts for differences, uh, they can then be sure they're getting a good deal and not favouring particular um, um, particular parties in the discussion. Um, the other thing I think is that um, there's other risks involved. So carbon capture and storage almost certainly needs to be part of the solution. But then who takes the long term risk? Um, I mean, people think it's a very low risk that the carbon would leak out again, and all the technical work says that's the case. Um, but there's something needs to be done to provide that reassurance to investors. So a lot of pieces need to come together. Um, and I say at the bottom, maybe there are too many options out there. And that's probably the headline summary of my talk is that at the moment there are too many options, too many bullets in the gun. Um, but the scale is such we need to find a way to start scaling up, start bringing costs down and start doing it very quickly. So I think that's about my time. So I will pause there and I'll hand back to Peter to uh, move on. Martin, thank you very, very much for that. A great summary of what's going on in Europe and, and, and sort of direction of travel. And of course, policy driven scenarios really sort of focuses on now pivoting east towards Asia uh, and beginning to start looking at what the story is going to be in this part of the world and how it will evolve, particularly as we know that obviously the gas industry is alive and well and will continue to expand in this part of the world. And we have obviously Japan and South Korea working heavily on developing a hydrogen economy as a way of decarbonizing their own domestic economies and offsetting in some form or another uh, their carbon emissions uh, through investment in new economies going forward. So without further ado, uh, let me hand over to my good friend, Mark Allen, who is the founder and technical director of Engico. Mark is a chemical engineer with over 20 years experience of which he spent the last 12 years specializing in sustainability and climate change in Australia. But now he's based in Singapore. Um, and as I say, is currently uh, responsible for his own company, Engico, that is doing a lot of very interesting consulting work within the carbon and climate mitigation space. So over to you, Mark, to really give us a, a viewpoint from this region um, and taking into account Stephen and Martin's comments uh, where you see the needle moving in terms of hydrogen economy development in this part of the world. Marco. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Now, I'm, I'm just going to have to really apologize. I'm having a lot of trouble now sharing the screen, which is um, a little bit annoying from my end. Um, apologies for that. Is there any way that um, uh, you could share from your side? Will? Yeah, no problem, Mark. Well done. Yeah, thank you. If you start talking, Mark, um, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll, I will. maybe start the introduction and we'll try and get the presentation online as soon as we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, one, once again, apologies for that, but here we go. So, okay, so we'll just get this into full screen. Now, so I'm going to talk about hydrogen in the Asia Pacific region. I'm actually going to concentrate on three key areas that, um, that we're going to look at being Australia, Japan, and China. So if we just go to the next slide, please. Um, as you know, we've been talking about quite a lot so far, it is really all about decarbonization, this new industrial revolution, this clean industrial revolution. And, and as um, Stephen quite rightly pointed out, it's about shooting all of the bullets in the gun that we have. And, and to achieve the goals that we've set under the Paris Agreement, it's about actually scaling up and unleashing all of the technologies that we have available to us, whilst still also researching some of the new tech that we might have available to us. Um, so on the next slide, please. So these are the three areas we are gonna look at. I'm gonna concentrate on firstly Australia as the supply side. So 
what is Australia doing around hydrogen, in particular hydrogen export, and is this the next big export opportunity for, um, for the lucky country for Australia? Um, then I'm going to look at the demand side. So um, from Japan's point of view, so we've got just there written, it's in Japanese, sorry, but it's um, uh, Suiso and Ammonia, uh, ammonia or um, Rioho. So basically, are we looking at hydrogen? Are we looking at ammonia? Are we looking at a combination of the two of these? Or are we looking at everything that um, they have available to them? And then finally, when I'm looking at China, I'm going to look at the manufacturing capacity for China and uh, the ability for China to scale up production of electrolyzers. As um, Martin just pointed out, the, the scale is actually enormous. What needs to be done is huge, and we need to scale up all of these things quite a lot to try and achieve um, these goals of, of getting hydrogen into the system. Um, so on the next slide, please. So looking at Australia, so Australia has a lot of abundant renewable energy. There's so much renewable energy in Australia and, and it's, it's all over the country, a lot of solar resource and a lot of wind resource. So, so the map on the left there actually just shows the solar potential for solar PV across Australia. This is in kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak. So it's a, a measure of efficiency um, and how much solar power energy can you generate. And you know the dark red areas are obviously the more prospective areas for installation of solar PV. One of the issues being obviously the dark red areas on that map are a long way away from any big loads and a long way away from you know the population centers which are all on the coast and sort of down south because it's all desert in there um so we have to then think about you know when we're scaling up these projects what is the best way of transporting energy is it power lines to a place where we can then extra generate something like hydrogen or ammonia and export or is it piping hydrogen all over the place, or is it generating ammonia in situ and, and trucking that to a port for, for export? So that's that's the first thing that we need to think about. Over on the right-hand side is a map showing the um, wind speed. So the average wind speed across Australia is about five meters per second at sort of a hundred meter high up height for wind power. There's actually a pretty good correlation of good solar resource and good wind resource that sits across the center of the country. And the good news is they often come at different times as well. Obviously the solar comes during the day, um, but uh, the wind speeds are often a bit higher through those parts of Australia across the deserts at nighttime. And of course, there's not too many people around to complain about having wind farms everywhere. So, but again, a long way away from population centers and a long way away from the grid itself. Um, there is quite a lot of wind available on coastal areas, particularly you know, near to um, where the population actually lives, which then that gives us an opportunity to maybe have excess renewables, so or curtailed renewables that might be able to go into manufacturing hydrogen with, um, with electrolysis. So um, like I said, pretty good overlap across the wind and solar resources, a lot of potential for generating renewable energy, uh, but yes, the transportation of maybe extending that into hydrogen is um, is key in, in that case. Um, so just go to the next slide, please. So Australia has been working on a hydrogen strategy and a hydrogen roadmap for some time. This is actually an area of the economy that um, realistically, both sides of politics are behind. This is pretty rare in, um, in Australia to have both sides of politics behind something, but uh, they're both quite supportive of developing this export industry for hydrogen. So the uh, hydrogen strategy was developed back in 2018. There's been a hydrogen roadmap in 2019. The individual states are all busy developing their own um, uh, hydrogen strategies as well. And there is a sort of midterm 2030 target to have H2 for two, $2 per kilo, um, is the target that uh, the Australian government has set that we're gonna get to. So that's shown in this graph on the right here is this sort of this band, right? And the, the um, bars here actually show what is the cost of the alternative, the future alternative of a different thing, the, the different energy source in that sector 
against hydrogen in that band. So you can see the alternative for trucks, battery electric trucks are now sort of sitting up around plus $3.50 per kilogram hydrogen equivalent. For cars, it's about $3. So if you get hydrogen to $2, then hydrogen is actually, green hydrogen is competitive against trucks and cars for long range um, uh, driving, ammonia and refinery gas. So this is not something that we haven't heard already, um, uh, particularly in Stephen's presentation. Um, a bit of a different story when it comes to the other potential use cases of, of hydrogen, and, and uh, Martin just reflected on some of that as well. So the price of hydrogen would have to be a bit lower to now move coal away out of um, steel making and to move natural gas out of um, uh, the use cases that we have there. So the Australian government itself is supportive of both green and blue hydrogen. In fact, just a few days ago, there was um, an additional uh, $500 million announced uh, in next year's budget um, on top of the you know, $120 million that was announced next uh, last year for CCS and hydrogen. Both CCS and hydrogen are seen as important areas for the country overall. Um, next slide, please. So there are a few projects and you can see here all of these blue and um, green and orange dots show where there is a project that's under consideration or operational um, within Australia. Now, I've just picked out a few. So in Queensland, there's a lot of projects um, under investigation and some pretty big projects. Um, uh, Martin did mention, you know, about the size of these projects. These is now 160 megawatts, 80 megawatts. Um, down in Tasmania and Victoria, we've got a brown coal gasification project that's produced what's well, constructed. And um, this is where the hydrogen supplies to Japan, the liquid hydrogen are going to be coming from. That will need CCS ultimately, because brown coal gasification generates a lot of CO2. Down in Tasmania, we're looking at 100 megawatts um, from Grange resources. Moving across to South Australia, again, we're sort of in the tens of megawatt range. Um, in the Midwest as well, 160 megawatts at Aerosmith and uh, 30 megawatts at um, uh, Geraldton. The Hazer process, which is this novel process around biogas cracking, there's a very small project demonstration plan operating in Perth right now. And then we get to the, the really, really big project, the Asian Renewable Energy Hub, which started off life as a way to export electricity via undersea cable to Indonesia and up to Singapore. Um, they're now targeting 23 gigawatts of hydrogen production, which is um, crazy. You know, we're, we're talking about for that project final investment decision in 2027 and then construction shortly after. 26 gigawatts of wind and solar, um, and then a whole lot of hydrogen and ammonia production up there. So that is one to watch. Who knows if um, they'll be able to achieve that scale so quickly. Um, another one of interest is actually the FMG mine at Christmas Creek, which where they're making a refueling station for um, a mine site trucks, but FMG's plans in particular with regard to hydrogen are pretty impressive. And they're talking about through Fortescue Future Industries, um, uh, developing 239 gigawatts of renewable energy and tying a lot of that to hydrogen if they can. Again, that number is, is staggering, just the scale of that. Um, okay, the next slide, please. Now, the big issue really is how does Australia get hydrogen out of Australia, right? And, and we've, we've spoken a little bit, um, and particularly Stephen spoke quite a lot about transport and the different ways of transporting hydrogen. So ammonia is, is a great way to transport it out because the infrastructure already exists. Um, if we are converging back to hydrogen, then that comes with efficiency penalties, obviously, but um, also as pointed out, ammonia is a great fuel um, in and of itself. Methanol also a possibility. Um, shipping as liquid hydrogen is about to start as um, at pilot scale with the, um, the Japanese, the Kawasaki ship. And Japan's already imported a couple of um, cargoes of hydrogen via this loaded um, organic hydrogen carrier, methyl cyclohexane to toluene. So more about that later. Um, so next slide, please. So moving on to Japan, so the next slide after this, um, 
what Japan is looking at is building the demand side. So they are building a whole industry around importing and using hydrogen within their economy. Um, the Japanese government is spending a lot of money on, on hydrogen development. Um, now they're building hydrogen vehicles and hydrogen and supporting infrastructure. And this is, you know, realistically, it's to support Japanese companies, Toyota, Kawasaki, Jera, Mitsubishi, etc., all investing in hydrogen production technology, hydrogen shipping technology, and hydrogen usage technologies. Um, local production may actually be possible for them. It really depends on the cost of what they can get their offshore wind in. It's a little difficult to build lots of solar in Japan because it's, um, it's quite mountainous and there's not many places to build solar. Um, but offshore wind is a possibility and uh, certainly my calculations say if you can get that around $50 a megawatt hour, then you should be in the market compared to importing hydrogen, um, you should be able to create, or they should be able to create their own. Um, so next slide. So looking at the ways that Japan is potentially going to get um, uh, ammonia or ammonia carriers into the country. So with Aramco through the Middle East, they're exploring using quite a lot of blue ammonia or generating a lot of blue ammonia. Um, plenty of advantages in the Middle East because there's natural gas availability and there's CCS potential in depleted reservoirs and other things and potentially using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Um, also, you know, looking at then being able to ship that ammonia from Middle East to Japan, they've done a couple of ammonia shipments already. Um, and there are many companies and many Japanese companies exploring um, ammonia as a hydrogen import vehicle from the Middle East. Um, the SPERA by Chiyoda process, so the Advanced Hydrogen Energy Chain Association for Technology Development, I think they came up with their acronym before they came up with their name, but um, they have delivered two um, deliveries now from Brunei, uh, which use this, this method where you load hydrogen onto toluene and then turn that into methyl cyclohexane and you can ship the methyl cyclohexane and then on the other side you turn it back into toluene. Um, and then you can ship that back. So um, they did use ISO containers rather than a dedicated ship for the first few deliveries. Um, and then finally, the um, Hystra project, which is um, shipping liquid hydrogen from Victoria to Japan. Um, so the hydrogen does come from brown coal gasification. There is CCS potential in CarbonNet, which is in the, the Gippsland Basin just near to um, where they're going to be gasifying the brown coal. Um, and um, uh, I should have mentioned actually, Australia is quite prospective for many um, CCS uh, storage locations as well, particularly in the Northwest. So blue hydrogen is clearly of interest there. Um, so then on the next uh, slide, please. So delving into what a couple of Japanese companies are actually doing. So JERA as part of their climate change strategy. So they're a big LNG importer and operate a number of coal fired power stations. So they're heading towards a net zero emissions target by 2050, as is the rest of Japan and pretty much all Japanese companies with that. To help achieve that, they are planning to import significant amounts of ammonia and shift all of their thermal power plants eventually to using 100% ammonia. So they're talking about importing upwards of 20 to 30 million tonnes of ammonia per year into Japan, which is about the same size as the amount that's globally traded now. Um, so yeah, really big numbers that they're talking about and a huge scale up of ammonia production um, globally to support this. Also looking at carbon neutral LNG and, and other things like that, but um, uh, ammonia into their coal fired power plants is a big part of their, um, their future strategy. Uh, on the next slide, we've got uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and what they're doing is developing use cases for ammonia. So they're developing, oh, sorry, for um, well, both ammonia and hydrogen. So they're developing things like um, hydrogen fired gas turbines and, and ammonia fired gas turbines to be able to now sell Japanese technology to the world and um, as a way for energy storage. So we've got up here in, in the top, that's you know their standard package that will use hydrogen in a gas turbine to generate power as energy storage. Hydrogen as energy storage um, certainly has some potential and in some ways hydrogen becomes a 
a better energy storage medium than batteries for long discharge times and storage over a long period of time. Down in the bottom right is the Magnum project from Utah, which is storing hydrogen within um, underground salt caverns. Um, they're also looking at storing compressed air and then using that as a battery storage in the Utah area, um, capturing curtail renewables um, as well. So next slide, please. Um, so heading into, into the equipment side in China, and I'm going to look specifically at electrolyzers right now. So if we just go to the next slide, um, you can see here's sort of the different types of electrolyzers that are available at the moment, right? And um, so alkaline and proton exchange membrane electrolyzers are the two sort of most common ones at the moment. Of note, and this is something that Martin pointed out as well, just look at the installed capacity. You know, in total today, there's about, or less than 100 megawatts of installed capacity globally of these things, and a lot planned, significant amount planned. So they're both commercial right now, um, different advantages for, for each one. And then some of the newer um, technologies that actually should be anion exchange membrane electrolyzers in the third box. So they're sort of um, lower technology readiness, but um, uh, do operate slightly more efficiently than some of the others. And then finally, the solid oxide electrolyzers, which are high temperature, but really high efficiency. Um, and uh, you can see they've got the lowest um, energy consumption out of all of these. So we just go to the next slide, please. So China currently has 50% of the world's alkaline electrolyzers. Now it's, it's obviously coming off a pretty small base. You know, there's only 40 megawatts installed um, globally, but they are expected to be ramping up production um, in coming years. Uh, you would expect that they will be working off what they've already got, which is uh, manufacturing capacity for alkaline electrolyzers in the short term, but potentially extending that into the PM electrolyzers um, in, in the medium term, I suspect. Um, there are studies, I think uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance were the ones that said that uh, production cost in China will be sort of a dollar fifty-eight a kilo from alkaline electrolyzers in 2030. So I think that might be a little bit bullish at this stage, but um, but we'll see, we'll see um, uh, what happens there. Um, on the next slide. So we can see just some the commentary around the learning rate for electrolyzers. So um, absolutely, as Martin pointed out, uh, 10 megawatts is the largest electrolyzer that we have in service today. Um, uh, now, there are companies that are offering electrolyzers 25 and 25 megawatt sort of stacks, but they're actually just smaller stacks that are put together and, and to create one 25 megawatt sort of turnkey solution, if you like. Um, so both ITM and NEL uh, out of the EU are building five megawatt stacks as the basis for these larger systems. So you'll end up with electrolyzer plants, um, larger electrolyzer plants, just being a whole lot of five megawatt stacks sort of joined together in, in parallel. Um, and I think it feels like five megawatts might become the, the sort of standard stack size going forward um, to support these, these bigger projects. Um, where will we see cost reductions? There'll be some coming from materials changes uh, and then stack design changes and then manufacturing scale. So this brings us into learning rate. Um, learning rate is estimated to be about 13% for PEM electrolyzers, which means every time the manufacturing capacity is doubled, you get a 13% reduction in cost. So a little bit lower than what we've been seeing in solar, but um, uh, it's still you know, a reasonably good learning rate for you know, relatively mature technology at this stage. Uh, so IEA expects there'll be 25 gigawatts per annum um, production capacity needed to in 2030. Currently, plans to expand capacity around 4.5 gigawatts per annum um, within the, that's announced expansion plans for manufacturing capability. And that will see prices then reduced by about 40% overall. Um, again, next slide, please. And you can see here in terms of future green hydrogen costs, where, where can we get to? So what we're talking about, the big chunk here in this first bar in the, um, in the waterfall chart is a big reduction in electrolyzer costs, 80% reduction in electrolyzer costs, which means a huge scale up in manufacturing capacity, which um, there is certainly an expectation that China will um, 
will grow in that area and start to ramp up manufacturing these things and taking advantage of the fact that they have a lot of the minerals that you need to, to create these, um, these machines as well. Um, next step is around electricity costs and then just some small incremental changes to get us down to a potential future cost of, of a dollar per kilo. Um, I can't tell you what time frame that's going to be in. I, I certainly would see that um, two dollars a kilo is probably achievable by the sort of 2030s, but depends on how much we ramp up um, production in that time. Um, so then next slide, which is the final slide. Um, so as has been said many times, hydrogen is a very important part of the decarbonized future, particularly in the hard to decarbonize um, sector sectors. You, I, we are seeing, you know, Australia making some pretty aggressive moves here and trying to replicate the LNG industry. I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to be as big as the LNG industry um, at this stage, but uh, because there are a lot of challenges, particularly in the transport area. Um, so. Overall, my view is that in, by and large hydrogen will probably be locally produced, um, either using locally uh, produced renewables or using renewable energy credits. Um, I certainly see that as the uh, sort of short term, um, short to medium term play for, for green hydrogen. Uh, but I absolutely think blue is a stepping stone to that and that the Blue hydrogen will help develop the markets and develop the science supply chains, and um, and you know the offtakes are very very important, much like the early days of the LNG industry. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. And, and at this stage, can I ask all panelists to please turn their videos on, uh, so that we can go into the Q and A session. Everybody's back. Good. All right. Well, I'm going to actually start from um, from a, a technology technical point of view, because we actually have talked a lot about ammonia in this, this call. Uh, and there are a number of questions around ammonia um, with regard to its toxicity, uh, with regard to its NOx emissions, with regards to its general utilization um, within economies going or energy economies going forwards. So Stephen, uh, over to you. Um, we, you, you sort of majored on ammonia a little bit. What's your view in terms of, you know, the feasibility of ammonia at a truly scaled up uh, product rate that we have obviously been advocating on this call tonight? Well, ammonia is one of the wi most widely traded and most heavily produced um, chemicals in the world today. Um, so scale already exists. I think there are 120 um, ocean terminals or sea terminals where you can load and unload ammonia and a decent number of ships. One of the big projects that was referred to uh, in the presentations, I think it was yourself, Peter, the, the NEON project, um, Helios, um, Saudi Arabia Air Products, um, that will make hydrogen, renewable hydrogen from wind and solar power, and immediately that hydrogen will be converted to ammonia for overseas distribution. Um, yes, we're seeing this liquid hydrogen pilot shipping taking place at the Suiso frontier. Yes, we've seen some LOHC hydrogen export pilots take place, but the ammonia supply chain exists today. You can jump straight onto it. Okay, anybody else want to make any comment about that? Uh, yeah. Go I, ahead, think, I, think, I don't think I would add is about ammonia for shipping. I mean, I think ammonia, if you use it as a hydrogen carrier and trying to extract the hydrogen at the end, that's probably more tricky, but I think that the decarbonizing shipping is a big challenge. There aren't many options out there, and ammonia seems pretty good for that. So I think to manufacture local ammonia and use that in shipping is a huge opportunity. Very good, very good. Thanks for that. Uh, so over to you, Mark. I, I mean, you <laughs> ended your presentation just now talking a little bit about, you know, hydrogen uh, and the development of economies being quite domestically focused, at least initially. Or, or, you know, locally focused uh, and, and maybe scale will come, but obviously, you know, in Europe and I, I think in, in Asia already, when you start speaking of the Japanese uh, and a number of Asian countries, we are looking at cross border trade as well. Which yeah. seems to suggest that clearly the price of carbon. Uh, and how that gets priced into the equation of scaling up is fundamentally important. And we can't get over the fact that at the end of the day, we're doing this because of climate change and the cost of climate adaptation and mitigation 
needs to in some way built in be built in to expanding you know modern energy technologies in the future so you know governments can't get away with nothing in terms of economies they have to find a solution to this sort of cross border price of carbon uh, you know we, we mentioned contract for difference carbon com contracts for difference how do we see this emerging i mean do we see this as something mm -hmm. that will develop at cop 26 and we'll sort of have a clear roadmap thereafter? Or do we see regions developing with different rules of the game and in different ways? Or do we actually yeah, yeah. see ourselves moving towards a more commoditized world in which to actually invest our money and make a sensible rate of return on those? <laughs> well, there, there is certainly a lot to unpack there, but um, carbon pricing, proper carbon pricing is, in my opinion, critical for um, all of decarbonization, right? We need that price signal in the carbon has a social cost that needs to be accounted for. It has an externality, externality that should be accounted for um, as an explicit cost. Now, uh, will that get addressed at COP26? Um, maybe not, but um, certainly there will be a little bit more progress around market-based mechanisms under Article 6 of, um, of the Paris Agreement. So uh, I think that might get finalised, but then it's still some time before that gets embedded. Now, the way you know, the UNFCCC works with regard to climate change, um, the framework, is that all of the countries are free to do whatever they see they should do. Um, and in many cases, I think that will involve some sort of carbon price. I don't feel like there will be a a global carbon price managed by the UN. I, I think that that will never happen. But I think there will be a whole lot of linked carbon prices and then sort of this increasing use of something like the EU carbon border adjustment, which, which will start to play out in terms of um, driving policy changes in other parts of the world. So, yeah, I, I think it's still going to remain fragmented for the time being, but we do need a strong carbon price to, to push some of these. And, and what the carbon price will do is then close that gap between um, green and blue hydrogen and, and natural gas, um, which is, I suppose, the, the, the next cheapest um, option. So Martin, maybe you'd just like to talk about this from you, from your your organization's perspective. You know the the price discovery process for carbon. Uh, you know it's clearly a core component of moving forwards and scaling up. How do you yeah. see that emerging, uh, both from a European perspective and from a global perspective? I mean, so I think I mean I certainly agree with Mark that carbon pricing is an essential component of making the transition. Uh, and Europe, of course, has had the European Emission and Trading Scheme for some time, and just in the recent months, it started to ramp up to be, you call sensible levels, you know, getting towards 40 euros a tonne. Um, that is starting to have some impact and to make some driving for decision making. Um, the challenge, as Mark said, is that unless it's global, the effect of a carbon price is just to drive high emitting industries elsewhere. And that leads to the European um, CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. But that adds huge complexity. So I think I'm inclined to agree with Mark that there will need to be, um, almost I think to drive investment decisions, it needs to be expectations that it will be a high and rising carbon price. And how that expectation gets built by government is I think hopefully COP26, there could be some progress on that. But in an ideal world, you wouldn't need have a global carbon price, but politically, that's very hard to see happening. But maybe a series of linked prices and maybe the adjustment mechanism can help to make them more linked than would be otherwise. Okay, thanks for that. Stephen, did you want to say something on that as well, or um, shall I move on? Just to add, the first country in Europe started doing carbon capture and storage through um, stat oil as it was then now Equinor was Norway. And why did that happen? Because the Norwegian government said very clearly CO2 emissions will cost you money. This is how much it will cost. And that's why Equinor built um, two carbon capture and storage schemes in the North Ski and, and led Europe into CCS. Yeah. Very good. Now, moving back into on the technical side, I wanted to just cover a point that uh, was raised by Kay Leung, um, 
who talked about Boris's 10 point plan um, and point seven being greener buildings um, aimed for 600,000 heat pumps every year by 2028. This, you know, it'll definitely boost the electricity peak demand and, and, you know, our electricity grids used to the idea that actually if we move towards a hydrogen economy, we're going to move towards more community heating and cooling um, and a completely different ways way power system going forwards. How, how well advanced is thinking around that change in architecture? Because we don't really hear very much about it. Stephen, you might want to start with that. Thank you. Well, there's tremendous, massive investment in battery energy storage taking place. You know, for example, in the United Kingdom grid, you, you talked about Boris Johnson's 10 point plan, um, huge lithium ion um, storage uh, projects taking place. And as was referred to earlier on, they're ideal for four hours charging and then four hours discharging. So great to cover that daily peak. For longer term um, grid balancing hydrogen energy storage, we saw the example in Utah, 100 salt caverns being built um, to store tons and tons and thousands of tons of hydrogen for seasonal energy storage. And the infrastructure is on the way, Peter. Good, Martin, did you want to mention anything there? Yeah, I mean, a couple of points yeah. on the heat pumps in the UK. I mean, I think in my talk, I mentioned the idea of hybrid heat pumps, uh, which is is quite popular in the UK. So a heat pump, I mean, one thing to say, it's very efficient, of course. So if you put in a kilowatt hour of electricity, you'll produce nearly three kilowatt hours of heat. Whereas if you go the hydrogen route for heating, you need to have probably about four kilowatt hours of electricity to make the hydrogen to then give you your three kilowatt hours of heat. So the efficiency comparison is huge. Um, but decarbonisation is going to require a lot more electrification and in general. So I think from a UK grid perspective, currently it's about 200 terawatt hours system per year. And um, that would be about 600 or 700 terawatt hours in a decarbonised system. So yes, the grid's already gearing up for that big change because electric vehicles, heat pumps is all part of the restructuring of the energy system. And um, as Stephen said, things are starting to happen. Very good. Any any comment from you there, Mark? Um, no, I certainly agree with um, with what they just said. It, it, we are going to see, particularly in residential, I think a big increase in electricity consumption from, you know, as houses become electricity based rather than a mix of electricity and natural gas, which is what they are currently. And we have induction cooktops and we have heat pumps and we have electric vehicles. And then it becomes actually also an issue then for the network operator, for the grid operator to, to try and maintain stability, which is now a combination of um, battery electric storage, grid scale storage uh, and, and community scale and virtual power plants and all of these things. That uh, that, that are being looked at and smart groups, obviously, and, and information. Thanks. Now, uh, wearing my Energy Institute hat, um, an interesting question here, which I think is worth actually discussing a little bit, which is safety focused. Um, you know, obviously, we have a large number of technologies, uh, as Stephen's talked about, large numbers of bullets in the guns, um, and yet. We are not really devoting very much time to developing technical guidelines, which potentially could become standards and procedures with regards to how all of these new technologies are going to operate safely, efficiently um, in the world of tomorrow. Um, what do you think we need to do about this? I'll start with Martin and then maybe ask all of you to have a little bit of a comment, because obviously this is very much something that the Energy Institute feels it has a role to play. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area. I think that's I think that's that's saying we aren't doing much. I think we are actually doing quite a lot at the moment. Um, because, so if you look in the UK, uh, so there's already been a trial of blending 20% hydrogen into the gas grid, um, and that required lots of technical work to be done to study and show it was okay. Um, and then the national grid uh, combined with distribution companies in the UK, they've got a test site where they're taking parts of the grid off the system to put onto this test site and see how it performs under hydrogen. 
and they built a couple of houses there to sort of demonstrate how that might work as well. So there's quite a lot of safety work being done and will definitely have to be done before it can uh, be real. And indeed, there's a long lead time for doing that. So, but the work has started um, and very important to do it, certainly. Stephen? Thank you. The one that I'll go to is carbon capture and storage or CCTS, carbon capture transportation and storage, as I sometimes like to say. The pipeline infrastructure that we will need for carbon dioxide movement will be as sophisticated in the future as the pipeline infrastructure that we need today for natural gas and in the future we'll need for hydrogen. It's the third pipeline network. And I don't think we're putting enough attention into that. There are some really good um, standards related to natural gas pipelines um, that we can perhaps adapt um, to be relevant for CO2 pipelines. But the last thing we want to, is to have moisture in those CO2 pipelines, get pitting, corrosion, explosions, leaks, or leaks of uh, anything out of it. So I think for me, where I'll put my hand up is um, we need to standardize and make sure that CCS pipeline infrastructure is built to a common standard and is built safely. And when I say to a common standard, that the companies making the steel, the companies making the pipelines, they need to know what they need to work to. And at present, it's all a bit loose. Uh, it's all very regional. It's all case by case, which is very good to be case by case, very flexible, very cost effective. But if you're a manufacturer of equipment and want to operate at scale, then it really, really helps to know what the uh, playing field is looking like. Thanks for that. Mark, any, a comment for you? Yeah, um, look, really go through good points from uh, both Martin and Stephen. And um, uh, I, I think with hydrogen, there, there has been, I think, a lot of work done in the safety and standards area, and ISO is busy developing standards currently as well. Um, and now hydrogen itself is you can, well, I've worked on hydrogen plants. I was a production manager for a hydrogen plant for a very long time. And it's, it's really big issue is it's got a very wide flammability range and a very low ignition energy. It's very, very easy to set hydrogen on fire. Now, I'm not saying that to scare people, it just is, right? That's just the physical properties of, of hydrogen and it's also a bit leaky. So, so certainly there is opportunities to, you know, improve standards and actually have standards around minimizing flange connections and having threaded connections wherever possible and using the right materials of construction and and having hydrogen within sort of intrinsically safe areas. Now, you know, we had a pretty big exclusion zone around our um, you know, admittedly quite large hydrogen plants and um, you know, no ignition sources at all allowed anywhere near it, uh, including from the clothes that you wear. So it certainly can be challenging, but these challenges are not insurmountable. Uh, where it might become a bit of a problem is if we start trying to use existing infrastructure with 100% hydrogen. I don't think that's going to be possible um, currently. I, I think it's going to be blended in the short term, and then you know, see, and then it might need an infrastructure replacement um, longer term. Again, to to the standards that we um, develop. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. And we're getting to the end of this webinar. So, unfortunately, I've only got one more question to ask before we run out of time. So, I'm going to go high level um, and, and take Martin's point about policy driven scenarios and, and drive that a little bit into where we think governments are going to drive action within the broad economies of the world. We kind of already know to a certain extent. You know, Boris's 10 point plan and, and what's happening in the UK is beginning to set a fairly clear policy driven scenario as far as the UK is concerned. We kind of think that's beginning to happen in Europe, but obviously there are disagreements as we've discussed with the Germans and versus other European countries and obviously the Russians and what they're going to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of geopolitics involved in this. So. I guess my question here is, given the fact that obviously we also have geopolitics at play very much so here in Asia, you know, with China and Japan and Australia all, all of kind of kind of wanting to do their own thing for their own purposes. How do we bring all of this together to create some form of policy driven scenario that allows for scaling up at a far more rapid pace than currently we're currently going in? Because I think. Stephen's point around many bullets in the gun is right, 
but as a result of that, perhaps the pace of development is not going at the sort of pace that we really need to achieve our net zero targets by 2050. So I guess my question is, how do we catalyze that process? What's missing to actually get that pace moving forwards? Uh, Martin, I'll start with you. I mean, I think just give a, uh, give a fairly brief answer. I think it has to be about dialogue between everyone. So I mentioned earlier, you know, industry and government regulators need to work together and they need to work across borders as well. So trying to do it in silos definitely won't work. It needs to be a global, it's a global problem, climate change. It needs to be a global collaboration to try and solve it. And hopefully in November in Glasgow may see some progress on that. Okay, clear, clear answer, Stephen. Flat carbon <laughs> tax nationally, best way for people to understand exactly how much it costs. And floating European emissions trading scheme is a bit like buying crude oil or buying natural gas. You don't know whether it's going up or down. The Canadians have done exactly the right thing. Secondly, uh, European taxonomy, 21st of April, the latest um, draft, provisional draft was issued. Um, it defines very clearly what sustainable investment means. Governments are going to put in money, a little bit of money. It's the first domino going poof. All of the other dominoes will be private investment. If investors and banks and corporations know what sustainable investment means, like the European taxonomy legislation defines, and if that becomes worldwide, then investment will be unlocked. Projects will move very quickly. Very good. And Mark, final yeah, question. Sure. So <laughs> how um how awesome uh so yeah the as you've said the thing that's required and the thing that doesn't move is we need to be net zero emissions by 2050 ish right and negative emissions after that we need to remove co2 from the um from the atmosphere so it is about how do we create the environment to promote investment in decarbonisation. So how do we move up the marginal abatement cost curve, gradually implementing technologies to help with the decarbonisation efforts? So absolutely, I think the way to go is a price on carbon and it needs to be a globally harmonised price. So all of these schemes are all linked together and then they just, you know, if you take a pure economic way, equilibrate at the size of the um, price point in the biggest scheme, you end up with, you know, equilibrating to the Chinese scheme ultimately. Um, then that's what's required. Now, now to generate investment in these specific areas, I think absolutely it's about public-private um, partnerships and public money catalyzing the private sector to um, to invest. Okay, thank you so much. And on that note, uh, gentlemen, Thank you so much uh, for taking part in the webinar today. I think we've covered a lot of ground. We've been around the world. We've talked a lot around a lot of schemes and a lot of bullets and a lot of guns. Uh, so I thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we will have um, some more sessions on hydrogen and of course CC, CCS and CCUS going forwards. We didn't really have a chance to speak as much as we should have perhaps spoken about that in this webinar. Um, so thank you all and we look forward to seeing you again and from the participants point of view they stuck with us so we had about 120 participants with us till the end so we've done extremely well and thank you all for listening in good night uh, good morning good afternoon happy lunchtime wherever you are uh, have a good day all the best bye bye thanks everyone bye